Hello and welcome back to the Facts of Facts, the only Facts of Life podcast that had to drink to get through this episode. Mm, I had five beers this morning. Yeah? How did that go? <laughs> I feel great. I drove around the block. Mm, you're wearing the sweater you wore yesterday. Yes. I see. Yeah. Um, how, welcome back. Britt, how are you? Um, I'm pretty good. Um, nothing to really to report aside from actually, you know, I thought that this episode wasn't that bad. That's exciting. I know. Isn't that exciting? And I think that it has to do with the fact that it really had almost nothing to do with the girls. <laughs> I thought, uh, to be perfectly frank, I thought this was going to be a bad, I thought this was like a mid-season backdoor pilot for Tootie's drunk older brother and his antics. No, no such yep. luck. Too bad. Do we ever see this person ever again? Never, ever Never again. again. Never again. I don't, I don't think, I could be wrong, but I don't even think that they bring him up again. <laughs> <laughs> that's, and so again, that's, that's weird, you know, typical facts of like, you know what? Should, what should we do an episode about? Let's, let's brainstorm some topics, some relevant topics, shit that's been in the news recently, right? Let's talk about, oh, driving under the in influence, a rise in drunk driving, right? Let's talk about that. Oh, shit, we don't have anyone that could possibly do that on this show, aside from Mrs. Garrett. So let's just bring in a totally irrelevant character that we're never going to see again. I mean, they could have. They have established that Blair is okay with underage drinking. She has drank in uh, the premiere of, I think, last season. And, and then... Tootie's, Tootie's a, a wino lush. And we also know that Blair can drive. True. But so, that, would be, that would be too damaging to bl the character of Blair. Fair enough. Uh, sometimes you gotta damage a couple of characters to uh, no, make an omelet. Not on, not on this show. We're just gonna bring in a random person, throw him under the DUI bus, and then send him away. Yes, <laughs> and that is uh, that is what they do. Um, anyway, so we've got an episode uh, today called "Let's Party." Yeah. And uh, it's directed by Azad Kalata, written by Jerry Mayer. So yeah. So here's the other great thing about this, in terms of uh, it being a Jerry Mayer ep Mayer episode, lots of fun, very of the time references. Yes. Yes. For sure. Yes. And I'm excited for us to get definitely into them. things that felt 1982 to me. <laughs> Not at all. Zero. Zero felt 82 to me. It felt. Like 1955. <laughs> well, that's probably, that was probably Jerry Mayer's best days. <laughs> when he'd go to all the motel parties he could find. Yeah. Motel to motel. Some of the motels have live music in them. Those are the, the halcyon days of Jerry Mayer. Yeah. His youth. Um, yeah, so this is a classic, very special episode about drunk yeah. driving, if you haven't figured it out. And... Um, yeah, I don't hate this one. Um, I, you know, I don't. I think your liking it is throwing me off. Like I'm, I'm, I'm weirded out. But I, <laughs> I'm excited to uh, see how this goes. That's um, that's 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 the thing. I like to throw a spanner in the works. I like to shake things up and make it and make a mess every single week. Where you're like, this one was the worst thing I've ever seen, and I'm like, this one deserved an Emmy. To be perfectly frank, I'm surprised that it. Ha they're not giving it to. They're not posthumously giving Mrs. Garrett an Emmy at, you know, the 2021 Emmys this year, but, you know, for all the non-work that she did in this episode. Um, yeah, I mean, she just let a kid, kid a kid she admits she knows is drunk, just get in the car and go. Yeah. <laughs> no problem. Yes. No, and then she yells at Tootie about it. Yeah. I mean, and Tootie tried, I guess. No. No, no she didn't. She no, didn't at, all. at the end she did, and that left the lasting taste in my mouth. But yeah, no, she didn't. She's like forcing her friends to get in the car. It's gross. Um, so we open in the icy throes of winter. Yes. Um, Natoot's rushing inside to complain about how cold it is, but Tootie is not wearing a jacket. And why is she not wearing a jacket, Britt? Because she's wearing a very fetching purple sweater that her brother Marshall gave her that she can't 
cover up with a jacket because she wants him to see it. And again, I thought, you know, we're going to get into this later, but this has an odd flowers in the attic vibe to me, this whole episode. Her obsession with her brother is bizarre. Yeah. They, and they just, they, it was like, and then it doesn't like, yeah, no, it's bizarre. It lasts for much of the episode, but it starts off so hot. So very hot. And I actually, you know, I thought this wasn't, I thought this was going to, to be perfectly frank, be it. So Natoots come in streaming in just at full blast of excitement because they've been waiting outside. They, they're just, they can't, they're so excited because Marshall's coming to hang out with them. Yeah. They're too excited to catch a cold. Yeah. They're too excited to catch a cold because I wonder if we tried that with the coronavirus. Like I am just so excited. That I'm I so excited. Catch. I can't, I can't, I can't catch it. I'm yeah. so excited about this. I've made myself immune with excitement. Yes. Yes. Um, because that's how immunity works. <clears throat> um, so anyway, so the, there, the thing is, is that these two girls are so excited about Marshall visiting because he's en route upstate for a ski trip. Right. Yes. That is correct. And he's stopping by to visit her. Yeah. Um, and check I, out the motel scene in Peekskill. I mean, and which we discussed at length last week about the amazing hotels and motels it all around the Peekskill area. Yeah. Anyway, by the way, for anyone watching this video podcast, our podcast, you just got a very close look at Dominic's cat's asshole. Oh, uh, I apologize. <laughs> I don't have, I have you in my view, but I don't have myself. So yeah, sorry. Okay. It's okay. Um, Anyway, so uh, it was just slightly distracting for me. Um, going back to what, what we were discussing. So I'm yes. hoping the split screen will edit it out. <laughs> yes, hopefully. Um, I actually hope that, you know, maybe some, some way, somehow, maybe someone can just pause it and, and you know, uh, zoom in on it. For... I hope YouTube makes it the thumbnail. <laughs> yes, me too. <laughs> anyway, so he's coming up there. She clearly um, is, you know, she worships him. She thinks he's the best in the world. Um, and so does Natalie. Natalie's super psyched about this. So I actually thought that this was going to be an episode around, you know, inter, um, like, the the dangers of hitting, of having a crush on your best friend's sibling. I thought it was going to be that. Rather than you know, your 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 siblings that I used to have a crush on is a drunk and drive and drive knowingly drives drunk. I didn't think it was. I thought it was going to be that. I thought it, thought it was going to cause a rift between Natalie and Tootie because to, Natalie has a crush on Tootie's older brother, and so she was going to be jealous. But sounds you know, like a decent plot. Yeah, I'd watch that episode. Yeah. Anyway, no, that's not that's not what we get. No, no, we get nothing like that. Um, uh, Blair has to basically spell out that whole thing uh, of, of the uh, I'm too excited to wear a coat. Uh, Blair is the one who's like to the audience. Translation, she doesn't want to cover up that sweater her brother gave her. It's such a weird roundabout way to make this point that it's almost artful in its ineptitude. Um, that's the thing, like... Just say, I'm so excited. Like, I'm, I can't, like, it's so cold outside. But, like, I, I just have Tootie wear a jacket and be outside and then be like, ooh, it's so cold. But I, I'm so excited to see Marshall. I haven't seen him in six months, you know, whatever. Like, that's fine. You don't need to talk about the fucking sweater that's also incredibly ugly. Yes. Um, Why are they drawing attention to this hideous sweater? I don't know. But what follows is really bizarre and poorly acted. This is yeah. uh, Natalie going... Older brothers can be so loving. I wonder how much money he wants to borrow. And then Tootie's like, you got to be kidding me. I was like, what What am I watching? Like, I, yeah. felt, I felt like I missed something. Like, I felt like I was high. Like, I watched the stream. I mean, uh, like, I was watching the stream on Daily Motion, And it was just, um, like, I don't know, like a minute or not even into the episode. And I was like. They cut something from this. And then I was like, I'm going to just pop in my DVD. I don't need to be lazy. I pop in my DVD. And I was like, no, that was that. That, that was, was it. Um, anyway, um, 
Uh, Natalie confuses me further by going, would I say anything negative about Marshall? Yeah. And she does the Superman parody bit. Yeah. And I was like, I didn't do any drugs yet. Yeah, I don't know. And, and the the amazing thing is it's so, it, it oddly had this, it vacillate, Natalie's excitement vacillated from like, I'm so excited, but like also negging him. Like, he's probably coming here to for, to ask my, you know, to ask his 12 year old sister for a loan, right? And it was yeah. like, that, is that a joke? And I then. Know. And then Natalie, and then she vacillates backward, back into being like, oh my God, he's amazing. He's, because they're going on a ski trip. She says an absolutely bonkers impression of, you know, of a sports announcer announcing that he's faster on the slopes than Jean-Claude Killy, smarter than Einstein in the classroom. He's so handsome. He's so smart. Look up at the sky. It's Super Brother. I was so weirded out by this. Like, I so weirded out by all... Like, this is the most disorienting opening the show has ever had. And yeah. I felt very oriented prior to this. <laughs> yeah, and, and so that's why I was like, oh, here's here's the kernel. Here's what this is going to be about. It's going to be that Natalie is besotted with Tootie's brother because she's already describing him as this, you know, perfect man, you know? Yeah, and, I mean... Maybe. However, however, let's let's just back it up. Do you know who Jean Claude Killy is? Please tell me all about Jean Claude. Would, would and would a teenage girl in 1982 know who the fuck that is? I don't know who he is, so I don't know if they would know. But I doubt that they would know unless he's like a, a actor on Silver Spoons. Because I didn't really watch that show. Is he? Is Jean Claude Killy an actor on Silver Spoons, Brett? No, he's not. He's a French World Cup alpine racing skier who dominated the sport in the 60s. <laughs> okay. And, and and won the all three alpine events in the 1968 Winter Olympics. So that's significant because um, those were the first Winter Olympics that were broadcast on ABC in color, like widely televised. So as soon as this... Uh, Le French, Jean-Claude Killy. I thought you were burping. <laughs> no, no, say no, no. It's just my French accent. Um, Starts off with le burp. Wow. <laughs> oui, oui, uh, uh. Um, anyway, so as soon as, as soon as, um, so Jean-Claude Killy became a, a world star at this point because he was sexy, young, and French. And so, and, very fast on the slopes, right? So um, same, 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 and same. Yeah, <laughs> yes, same. Um, so he became an overnight celebrity, and it, it, his Wikipedia page specified especially with American women. But Ooh, in la, nineteen la. in nineteen sixty eight. So okay, but um, he also was. Um, I, I the other thing that was funny that was notable was that. He was, um, he became known to children, this was according to his Wikipedia, known to children, well known to children, American children in the 70s for a commercial that he did for something which was not described on his Wikipedia page, but he, he, he shows up and gives and talks about it, but he speaks of, he uses his very heavy French accent and says his name and it sounds like Chocolate Kitty. So he was known as the Chocolate Kitty. <laughs> it was so okay, and this is not the in most insane thing that happens in uh, that I know about this man at this point. Please go on. So he also starred as himself in the 1983 comedy, Canadian comedy called Copper Mountain: A Club Med Experience, that starred. Alan Thicke and Jim Carrey, which was a quasi-commercial for the Copper Mountain Ski Resort. That, that had sounds just... like a great movie. I love a ski resort comedy. Yeah. So and Canadian, that just means it's going to be heartwarming and nice. So it basically, it um, it's Alan Thicke, is Alan Thicke and Jim Carrey go to this resort, this ski resort, to like... You know, they're a, an odd couple. I mean, Alan Thicke and 
Jim Carrey, they don't seem odd, like an odd couple to me at all. They seem like a perfect couple. Anyway, um, they go there and Alan Thicke is like obsessed with like, you know, winning some race or something. And so he has, that's his arc. And Jim Carrey's is that he's obsessed with, you know, he's a pussy hound. So he's like all doing like, he's doing, he's being fake and phony and trying to pick up all these women. And that, but then he finally gets together with someone by being himself. I feel like you must have watched this because I felt like I was there. <laughs> yeah, that's the end. But the other great thing is that this is how it's described. The majority of the runtime consists of performances by prominent country musicians. Ooh. So that's, that's why you probably haven't seen it or yeah. you wouldn't want to watch it. Yeah, I might not now that you've given me more information. I, lo- I looked up who all the country music stars were. They were not prominent. I have no oh. idea. <laughs> Oh, there's nothing worse than being called not prominent. On the facts of facts. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. Uh, when we, when you know, I spent some time last week talking about Edna Dix, yes. who only has one credit on all of the internet. So and it's, and prominence it's... means very little to us. <laughs> yes, true. <laughs> um, anyway, um... All right, so in the toots are just acting super weird. Tootie forgot that Marshall had gifted her some helpful items of clothing, like gloves and a scarf. That matches her sweater. And here's where I wrote down, what? Does Jerry <laughs> Mayer not understand how clothing works? No one wears a sweater that matches their hat and scarf. What the hell? What are you matching for everything from the bot from the from the waist up? Yes, yeah, just wants to be one block of purple. Which I assumed it was going to be, and then she was going to look like grimace. No, thankfully, because the the sweater is purple with tur- turquoise lines. The yes. the scarf and the hat were turquoise, so it it was it was a compliment a complimentary ensemble. It worked nice, but you would think like if she was so excited to show off a gift that she was willing to risk the cold, she would remember the other components of the gift that would also shield her from the cold. I just felt like this was not well thought out, but who am I to judge? I guess I am the person to judge. Us. We're the people who judge this. We are. It's us. Okay. (laughs) Um, Anyway, um... She puts Natalie in charge of being on the lookout and to scream when she sees him. Yeah. And Natalie says, I basically it was like she always screams when she sees Marshall. Ew. It's like, well, Tootie always screams when she has a line. Um, <laughs> Joe enters with Mrs. Garrett, super excited to set Blair up by asking her, guess what I dug up out of the dirt? I Okay. So here's the thing. I laughed. I laughed here. And I never laugh at this show. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> sometimes here's the thing is that when, when you and I are talking about this show, you're always like, I had a genuine laugh at this. And I, I'm always like, you know, a stone. You know, it's as though I'm like witnessing a funeral. You know, I'm like, no, there was, n- there was no jokes in this episode. As soon as, as soon as Joe comes in and says, guess what I dug up out of the dirt? And Blair says, your face. I was like, (laughs) yes, yes, perfect. (laughs) Uh, It was a startling response. I was almost startled myself by laughing. I was like, what what is is this shocking noise that's coming out of my throat and face? This doesn't happen when I do this, when I watch this horrible show. Oh, not at all alienating the listeners to this podcast who love the show, (laughs) Um, uh, myself included. Um, So it is not Joe's face that she dug up from the dirt. No. It's her bok choy. It's a bok choy. (laughs) Was this episode, speaking of how many times they mentioned bok choy, was this episode sponsored by the U.S. Council of Bok Choy Farmers? (laughs) Um... Uh, you, we do get uh, Mrs. Garrett giving the explanation. It's Chinese cabbage. Just, <laughs> it is. Okay, so everybody's like, what? Um, so I, I think I know why they chose bok choy. Okay. Sorry, bok choy. 
Is it um, because it sounds like cock choy? No, but I know that that's what you would think. Um, I do <laughs> like that they accent it because it's Chinese and just like Chinese food, which they accent the wrong word on. <laughs> Yes. Uh, they, they've chosen to do that also with Chinese cabbage by calling yeah. it bok choy. Um, I, it's bizarre. But yes, um, Mrs. Gash says, she says Chinese cabbage with like a touch of victory in her voice. Can you, can, can you emulate it? Chinese cabbage. <laughs> um, and then Blair offers an E-I-E-I-O. Yes. Uh, so I think I know why they chose bok choy, which is that it takes 45 days from seed to giant bok choy. So okay. it's a very good, um, beginner ingredient that yields encouraging results. I see. And also because you're going to be like, I don't like bok choy, but I could do this. With a thing I do like. Okay. But that thing you do like is probably strawberries, and that's a pain in the ass. So you're like, all right, well, cool. So what you're saying is that Jerry did, Jerry Mayer did an did extensive research into horticulture and vegetable cultivation, and was like, okay, what would a teenage, what would a sixteen year old girl who is just starting out with her first vegetable garden grow? Yeah, I think. Yeah, that- bok choy, bok choy, bok choy. Bok choy. Bok choy. Um, I, I do think that he had that, or somebody had that information in their back pocket, because um, I, we Google a lot of this shit, and, and it doesn't usually factually check out. So this was nice. No, Bok choy. It, no, it's, it was, I, I feel like it's just to make, it's just to give Blair that stupid joke. E-I-E-I-O. <laughs> but anything is a... Uh can be grown and make a farm joke. No. Here a buck, there a buck, everywhere a buck, buck. It's like old Nick Donald had a farm. Oh! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Blew my mind. <laughs> and you know, at the beginning, when I was like, okay, there's clearly a joke here I'm not getting. It must be super grown up and sophisticated that I'm just like, oh, okay, well, I get it now. But uh, no. No, it's a children's nursery <laughs> rhyme, Dominic. Okay, so yeah, that's the sophistication of this show. Yep. Okay. Um, yep. Uh, horn honks. <laughs> and Natalie does just as promised, screams yeah. like a maniac that Marshall has arrived. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wrote at this point, I'm perplexed what Natalie's relationship with Marshall is. Me too. <laughs> it's strange. Um, but I'm, I'm also perplexed as to... What Mrs. Garrett's relationship is with Marshall? Well, I think Mrs. Garrett's relationship with Marshall is that that with all younger men, which is that she wants to be flirted with. Oh, okay. And she will take any kind of nicety to mean that this guy is subliminally eye fucking her or something. Okay. Um, that is usually her relationship with most men. Anyway, as Mrs. Garrett tries to peg the word potato into the menu board. Yes. She, she muses that it's a shame that Tootie has no use for her brother to no one at all, to the audience, frankly. Yeah, she says it in that really gross Mrs. Garrett throaty way. Yeah, as if to say, like, oh, stop me, I'm incorrigible. Yeah, like, it's a shame. It's a shame how that girl has no use for her brother. And it's like, she's basically saying, like, yeah, she can't have use for her brother, so send him my way. I can have use for her brother. Sure. Uh, then Blair asks herself a question out loud. Yeah. Whether or not she wonders, whether or not she missed out not having a brother. And, and then, then she, she says, yeah. she goes, nah, who could deal with a boy as good looking as I am? Again, uh, again, a very sort of flowers in the attic type gross incest joke. That is true. Also, she dealt with a boy that was just as good looking as her in a different drummer. And so I feel like if she could deal with him, she probably could deal with her sexually attractive brother that they were 
implying she would have. I also hate when people set themselves up for a joke and then deliver it and then pretend to enjoy it, even though no one else is enjoying it. Not the audience, not the other people on the set. Nobody's enjoying it. And they're just like, I have five. <laughs> I hate that. Um, so I then Mar- to myself. Yeah. <laughs> Marshall the Magnificent enters. Yes. As heralded by Natalie the Perceptive. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Those two greeted one another like two fucking nerds at Comic Con who haven't seen one another in a year. Yes. Yes, they did. It was like one was dressed, you know, Natalie was dressed as Shrek and, you know, Marshall was dressed as the Mandalorian. And it was like, oh, hi, Marshall the Magnificent. And he's like, yeah, hi, Chub Chub. Nice to see you. Um, I cannot stand Marshall the Magnificent from the first second he walks in. Um, I think that, um, this guy is more insufferable than I recalled. Mm. Um, but really? let's. I actually, you know, he actually was like kind of like the least bad part of this. I thought that both the other two dudes that were involved in this episode, his buddies, his ski friend buddies, were way worse and more insufferable. But we'll get into that later. Oh, I'd suffer those fools. <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, let's talk about Marshall the Magnificent. He's played by. Kevin Sullivan, yeah, who uh, got his start in the well-known American Graffiti sequel, More American Graffiti. Did you know that that existed? <laughs> no, but that's amazing. <laughs> I here's the thing that that's that's like that the laziness of that is basically like the laziness of like a Facts of Life episode. But it's just it's sort of like American Gra- Graffiti two, but T O O. You know, it's like. One of those dumb things, like, we're back again, you know, American Graffiti. Here we are. Like, I always hated when sequels would do more American Graffiti, because that would mean at the video store, American Graffiti is an A, but I'd have no idea that there's a sequel all the way in the letter M. Uh, that That is confusing, as though you would want to watch both American Graffiti, your favorite movie of all time, and then also back-to-back watch its sequel, your favorite movies. <laughs> I'm kind of curious, to be honest. <laughs> um, so he moved on from there. He did another sequel. Was Star- it Grease? Grease 2? No, it was Star Trek 2, The Wrath of Khan. Ooh. Ooh. Ricardo, Monto- Ricardo Montalban plays Khan in that. Oh, well, then you know his work. Yeah, um, I, actually, you know, I, I wanted to just talk about Ricardo Montalban briefly, only because um, I, I, we, in my house, we speak of him frequently because he was on The Love Boat, no? That sounds right. Yeah, because The Love Boat comes up on this podcast and this show a lot. Um, and uh, Ricardo Montalban was in a commercial for some mid-sized American car, and he's describing it, and he says, it is nothing but fine Corinthian leather of the seats. And I say that all the time about any leather product ever. This is fine Corinthian leather. And that, without <laughs> context, could come off offensive to people. It could. It might be it an could. earshot. <laughs> um, so after Star Trek, he did uh, Night Shift and then a TV movie called The Young Landlords, which seems to have brought the couple of Marla Gibbs and Hal Williams together. They um, ended up starring in 227. Ah. Uh, and uh, let's see. And <clears throat> he also did 13 episodes of Happy Days over five seasons. Oh. And his uh, last acting role was in the 1984 film. The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai, which I assume you know. I have that tattooed on my neck. Okay, so it's about a brain surgeon rock star, ah. Buckaroo, Buckaroo Banzai, and his crime fighting team, the Hong Kong Cavaliers, who have to stop alien invaders from conquering Earth. John Lithgow played Lord Horlin. Ellen Barkin was Penny Pretty. Jeff Goldblum played New Jersey. Christopher Lloyd played John Big Boote, and uh, Yakov Smirnov played the National Security Advisor. I feel like you, well, I feel like in some way I just, like, was, I hotboxed a car, and you just said all of that to me, and you were just riffing. I thought you made all of that up. <laughs> 
That's a real movie that is bananas, and uh, you should see it. I just wrote it down. Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai, yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, after that, he uh, directed some TV, including Fame and Frank's Place. He actually was a writer on Fame as well. Um, and in 1998, he directed a little movie called How Stella Got Her Groove Back. Aha, uh-huh. that's a mm-hmm. great movie. Uh, He went on to do a lot more TV, like The West Wing, Ed, 30 Rock. He did some more films, Barbershop 2, Back in Business, Mm -hmm. going back to his sequel roots. Yes. Um, (laughs) And uh, he also did Guess Who. Um, And most recently, he's directed episodes of You, The Good Fight, and This Is Us. Wow. So he's working. He's doing good. Yeah, he's doing great. Hasn't acted since 1984 and probably doesn't have to. Yeah. Why, why, Why would you? I mean... When you go out on a high note. Like Buckaroo Banzai, yeah. Exactly. Absolutely. So Marshall gently hits on Mrs. Garrett just the way she likes it. Yeah. And um, then Joe, like a child, says, Marshall want to see my bok choy. <laughs> yeah. So, again, I, I was like, this this is being, you know, bandied about, like, do you want to see my cock choy? Like, it's like a weird, it's this odd thing. I'm still not seeing that. <laughs> It's just because it's, they keep saying bok choy. They do. They say it weird, but I feel like it's just because it's new to them. I don't think they're like, how can I make this sound more like cock? Oh, I know. Bok choy. (laughs) But again, also, yeah, it is a kind of weird thing. As you said, like a little kid would do, be like, hey, want to see this thing I made? You know, but again, it's like, do you want to see this vegetable I grew from, you know, to a man that you like, I guess... You have met before, but like hasn't even taken his coat off yet. No, I know it's very, it's very weird. It is like a ten year old, just like, hey, want to see my bok choy? But there's still this weird suggestive intonation in it that is sexual. It's, it's weird. And he's like, very nice. No, he uh, says he goes, he goes, I'm impressed. And then Joe's like, mm, and her brow furrows, and she's like, I had another one, but it croaked. What? Why? I don't know. And the audience laughs because we're in some kind of David Lynch version of Facts of Life. Every episode is a big David Lynch version. Uh, anyway, Mrs. Garrett, congrats on making Phi Beta Kappa. Yep. Marshall's like, how'd you find out about that? And he's not even being facetious. How is this idiot Phi Beta Kappa if he can't figure out that fucking Tootie brought this up at some point? Hey, are you on the newsletter? Oh, yeah, exactly, the newsletter. No, so Phi Beta Kappa is the oldest academic honor society in the U.S. It was founded at the College of William and Mary in 1776. My mom's Phi Beta Kappa. Oh, well done. Congratulations, Dominic's mom. Yes, I'll pass along your goodwill. Thank you. Um, We don't have a chance to think about this much because uh, Hunk enters. Oh, yes, some man in a shearling coat, driving coat, comes in. This is Paul Walsh. And he's terrible says, name. Paul yeah, and he goes, Walsh. You can't have the says, same exact vowel sound as like, your only vowel in la- your first la- and your last. La- Paul Walsh. Not even lazy, it's just awful. Paul Walsh. Yeah. And he goes, Hey Marshall, I tighten the ski rack. Uh, I'll tell you, he tightened my pants too. <laughs> and Blair just literally said Blair had a gusher downstairs and she no, goes. No. And she goes, hello, Awuga. Uh, yeah, so um, he's Marshall's roommate, and he is played by Michael Harrington, who has quite an interesting IMDb. I'm excited to hear about it. Okay, well, he started off with small roles in things like Camp Counselor uh, in Little Darlings, Man Number One on Chips, Party Guest on New Heart. He was Officer in Beverly Hills Cop. And waiter in Charles in Charge. Then he got a name. He was Joey Bogosi on Who's the Boss episode. Um, and he better than Paul Walsh. Yes, Paul Walsh. Um, <laughs> then he did a couple of episodes of Santa Barbara, the soap opera, but he never got a name. He was always just Monk Number Two. Monk? What? Not He's... Hunk? <laughs> Monk, not, not Hunk. Number Two. <laughs> Here's where things get interesting. Okay. Seems around the late 2000s, or the early 2000s, I should say, yes. Um, he was uh, part of the drag scene. Oh. So he played uh, drag Gwen Stefani on an episode of Gilmore Girls. 
Lorelai's oh. bachelorette party. Um, and uh, he was also Mona the drag queen on an episode of Guardian the same year. And I guarantee you that he was just a drag queen without a name in the script. And then, like, his agents were like, you need to give him a name because that's important now. And you can buy your name by being, like, visibility. You can't just be, like, drag queen. That's offensive. Because you yeah. can't be, like, man. And and agents will have, like, no way to, like, you know, argue that up. But right. But if it's, like, if it's, like drag queen and be like that representation what are you doing man give the drag queen a name what's the drag queen's name so mona the drag queen is what the name was in the credits for the guardian um aside from two episodes as mike which is his name in two short films uh that's all he's done but his imdb biography written in first person needs you to know a couple of things about him he's pro tennis player played the u.s open he lives in L.A. with his lovely wife, model, actress, and jewelry designer, jewelry designer, not Julie designer, uh, Peggy. No last name. They have two beautiful daughters, Kelly and Brooke, and um, he has not been a television drag queen in two decades, although it doesn't say that. Huh. Ah. So I was going to ask, so he, he isn't actually a drag queen? No, either he went through a phase... Mm. Or he got a role because somebody was like, you know, you look just like Gwen Stefani. Hang on, let me put this wig on. We need a Gwen Stefani for Gilmore Girls. And then all of a sudden his agent's like, you want to do another drag role? And he was like, sure. <laughs> I don't know the backstory. <laughs> make sure make sure my character has a name. <laughs> yes. You get more money if your character has a name. Of course. Yeah. Um, anyway, so everybody is being introduced to Paul when Blair cuts the line because wait, he's so hunky. Wait, I need to, I need to just pause here. So, Please. so he, um, Paul, Paul Walsh, I, Paul every, Walsh. Paul Walsh, every time I say it now, I feel like, um, Jane Krakowski on 30 Rock saying the rural juror. Rural juror. Rural, rural Walsh. juror. Um, anyway, so he's, hi, I'm Marshall's roommate. And then Tootie's brother says, this is Paul Walsh. Meet Tootie. My Paul Walsh. Tootie. Meet Tootie, my sis and her friends. And he leads with Mrs. Garrett. He goes, my, and her friends, Mrs. Garrett, Natalie, and Joe. And it's like, just say Natalie and Joe. And this is Mrs. Garrett. She works here. It's so weird. It's like, <laughs> Mrs. Garrett isn't their friend. She's That's a good point. I didn't even catch that. Uh. <laughs> I was momentary. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> Does he think that she's just a friend? Like she's just an older lady that's friends with Tootie? This is my fifty-year-old friend, Mrs. Garrett. I'm you twelve. <laughs> uh, that is a very good point. I didn't catch that, and I love it. So everybody's being introduced to Paul Walsh, and Blair cuts the line because Paul Walsh is so hunky. Hunk um, Marshall and Paul Walsh get the invite to dinner. Yes. Uh, Mrs. Garrett grabs Joe's bok choy to steam. Yeah. And uh, Joe chases after her because that's going in a fucking scrapbook. Yeah. She says no one cooks. phoned in. That's like left on an answering machine tape that, that got cut off. It's so, it's like, she's like, nobody cooks that. That's going in my scrapbook. It's what like, the hell? I'm going to figure out how to masturbate with it. No, but also it's like, why are you, like, she has this brand new solar green, solar powered greenhouse, which of course I'm sure we never see or hear of ever again. No, never again. Never again. This brand new contraption that where she's learning horticulture and learning how to cultivate vegetables. And what is she's like? No, we're not going to eat any of these. What is she hoarding them? What's going to happen to all this bok choy that she's grown? Nothing. Also, the greatest thing is that Mrs. Garrett's like, oh, as a special treat, we're going to steam up some of Joe's bok choy. And it's just like, wow, I actually, to be perfectly frank, can't think of something less special treaty than steamed bok choy. No. Not be because it, it's, again, I, I actually like bok choy. Um, bok choy. Bok choy. Um, I love all... Um, cabbages, but bok choy is. <laughs> I want to do, do a sample, like when we do a commercial for this show, if we ever do one. I want to definitely cut a clip of you just being like, "I love all cabbages." 
<laughs> it's true. I do. I do. I do love all br- every every part of the brassic community. I love. Anyway. Oh, <laughs> anyway. Um, but do you again, think a brassic pickle? Vlasic. Oh, then I don't know what we're talking about. Go well, on. Brassica is the uh, family name for any cabbage. Any cabbage. <laughs> So sorry, I did. Your loves. I, I here's the thing. I I did take horticulture when I was in college. So was that um, overseas? What was that overseas? No, that wasn't. That was actually in the United States. Um, uh, in the states, okay. In the states, anyway. But like, that, that's the weird thing is that it's like steamed bok choy. It's almost flavor free. Yeah, yeah. Like I, what a special treat. treat. To be perfectly frank, put it in the fucking scrapbook. You know what? It's not a treat. Yum. Eat it or not. It doesn't matter. Anyway, let's keep going. Take a freaking picture of it. If you're yes. really that proud, take a picture of it. Take a picture of you eating it. Pitch. If you can borrow the, the AV Club's camera, film yourself eating it. Create the first mukbang. Whatever you want to do. Preserve your bok choy, but move on and, and grow your broccoli. Well, Get exactly. She does. Blank, yeah, and grow it. This was, but it, it, again, let's just comment on the fact that this was just such a bizarre B plot or A and a half plot or whatever the fuck this was. F plot. <laughs> where, where it's just Joe's newfound gardening love. But you know that the writers were so proud of themselves when they were like, we can, we can dovetail Joe's broccoli blanket with Blair's security blanket. Yep. It's yes. gonna be brilliant. They were like, oh shit, did you see that? That's fucking synergy. We are cooking with gas here now. <laughs> um, so Marshall informs Tootie that they actually have better plans than steamed bok choy with yeah. an old lady that's masquerading as their friends. They have a motel party. Yeah, they're and having before a Before she party. starts fucking whining, because she's about to. Oh. Yeah. He's like, you can come. Yeah, he's like, you're invited. But, and he's like, all of you are invited. And then I literally literally wrote down, as soon as Natalie hears that, she does her best Chris Farley playing the Kool-Aid man impression of excitement. She just like, is like screaming. She's like the Hulk. She rips off her like sweatshirt that has a, 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 a balloon on it in excitement for this <laughs> college party that she's gonna go to. Uh, yeah, they're, they're, uh, she also, she's so excited, she says she's never been invited to one of his parties before, we've also never heard of the guy before, so it's not that big of a deal, but, um, everybody, all the girls are invited except for Mrs. Garrett, because she's old. Yeah. Um, and. And then uh, I wrote down that Blair and Paul Walsh, I fuck. Yes, they do. And, uh, Mrs. Garrett's so inconsequential, we don't even need to break the news to her. No. She's, let's just hope she didn't start steaming Joe's only shot at motherhood. Agreed. And we fade into... <gasps> a new set? Yes. A new set. Oh, my God. They made and... a motel set for the party? I couldn't believe it. Yeah, and I also can't fully understand it. Like... <laughs> Yes. Like the parking lot is like right there and they have this like giant bay window that they can or cannot It's not a bay window, it's a sliding door. To the parking lot? To the parking lot. So like that seems dangerous. Yes, of course it is. And it also seems like you can really skip out on a bill or something or just Right. You know, try to have sex. Like it's uh, this is the this is the this is the Bates Motel. This is the Bates Motel. <laughs> Nice one. Put that together. You guys watched that happen. <laughs> um, anyway, um, so yeah, we fade into a cool party with adultish kids eating pizza, drinking Indeed. beer. Um, they're in a motel, so you know it's cool. It's so cool yes. that Tootie is bringing Marshall beer, and he's legally allowed to drink now. Not like that time when he was 15, and his dad got the strap out, and Tootie started crying. Yeah. These are the stories they tell at this cool party. <laughs> Well, so again, you know, so we open up in this shitty motel room, which to be perfectly frank, having a pizza party drinking beer, you know, with college students is way more fun than having steamed bok choy with an old lady. I mean, no one is denying that the party is more fun than bok choy. No. But as far as parties go, 
True. Um, and then, so, um, Marshall asks Tootie to grab him another brew from the cooler. Brewski. And she counters, she counters that he's not even done with the first one. First of all, how would she know that? And second of all, how dare she? <laughs> yeah, okay. I'll, I'll, I'm with you on that. Um, uh, apparently, Tootie is Marshall's lucky charm. Because yes, because the last time, so well, the last time, she can't believe it. As you said, she can't believe it that um, he's actually drinking legally. That's crazy because, yeah. you know, she remembers the last time that her, that like their dad caught him drinking when he was underage, when he was 15, and he was get, about to get, he was about to get uh, the strap, right? Yes, the strap out. He was, he was get about the to get the strap out. out, and then Joe enters and gets the strap on. Hey, uh, uh, no, and so, uh, anyway, so he's about to get the strap out, and then Tootie starts crying. Yes. and like so a little just, bitch. <laughs> so, and so, he doesn't get a lecture, he just gets a lick it. He, rather than a licking, he gets a lecture. Uh-huh, yes. Joe, also, she gives a lecture, and then the licking. And uh, Blair is also here to give Marshall's friend Paul Walsh a licking. Yes. Uh, Paul Walsh. Make some lame joke about how Blair's dad has been on his back for years. Oh my god! And then he, it's and then label and then joke. He so, and then he he shows off. It's the label of the inside of his hideous brown vest. Yes. There was a lot of vest action in this episode. Yeah, this episode was sponsored by Warner Textiles, trying to launch their new line of awful vests. Yeah, there were. Three bad vests in this episode. This is number one. Yes, this is a bad one, but it isn't the worst one. No, it's um, not. Then uh, he but, says, oh, "I was sorry." Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that. You know, the funny thing is, is that so he makes he's so Blair. So Paul Walsh is pursuing Paul Walsh, Paul Walsh is pursuing Blair like around the room. He's just sort of following her, and she's just walking away and. He, you know, opens up his vest to say, you know, to to, to flirt with her, um, and then he says, "My dad." Check out my vesticles. Check, check, yes, chef's kiss. Thank you. Um, and she, and then he says he flirts with her because they're just going to discuss their dads. They dad flirt. He says, "My dad's wacko," and yeah. Blair's like, "What?" He's starting him as a bottom. <laughs> yeah. And so he goes, no, 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 you know, Walsh Communications Company. And Blair says, oh, you're in newspapers and radio and TV. And high heels and whatever <laughs> Gwen Stefani's going to be wearing in 2001. <laughs> yeah, so haul a bat girl, I guess. You know, a lot of Harajuku type shit, you know. Yeah, that shit is bananas. That shit is bananas. <laughs> Natalie... No, As, hold on. This oh, I'm is sorry. Why I actually, when I saw, when I actually, because they zoomed in on Blair and Paul Walsh, you know, having this conversation about their dads, you know, dad flirt. And Paul Walsh looks 45 years old. He looks like he should not, like he's been held back. He does not look as though he should be having any conversation with a 16 year old girl. I, I don't disagree. Yeah. Um, uh, also, some some heavy cheekbones on this guy. He's very good looking. Can cut ice. Yeah. Um, Natalie has found herself with George. Oh, yeah. You mean Manly? <laughs> That's so, perfect. I don't even need to give him an adjective. He's definitely like the most hairiest and also most balding person in the entire party. Again, 45 years old. What the yes. hell's going on? Why did they why did they cast these old people to be th at a college party? I, I don't I don't have the answers. At least Tootie's brother is age appropriate ish. Yeah, Tootie's brother's perfect, but it's sort of like just cast You love him. No, yes, I love him. And I love drunk driving. No, I who cares? I, no, but who yeah. cares? <laughs> who cares if I love drunk driving? <laughs> I love truck driving, and I love all types of cabbage, and I am okay with that. Yes. <laughs> and I, I stand by this message. 
<laughs> um, so Natalie asks him where, what journalism school's like, and he tells her to prepare for her mind and her asshole to be expanded. Stretched. Oh, my bad. Yes. Um, Here's the thing. If you said, if he, if he said, you know, Natalie, just get ready to have your mind expanded. That would have been okay. That would have been fine. No. He says, Natalie, and imagine a 45-year-old George Costanza-esque man speaking to Natalie, who's 15 years old. Natalie, just get ready to stretch your mind. It was gross. Also, the great thing about this is here's what I wrote down. Natalie managed to find Manly the worst man at the party. Always. That's Natalie's thing. He's the worst man. Oh, my God. He's so horrible. Should we talk about him? Yes, but also, why is he in journalism school? That means that he's like 25 or 26. What's he doing hanging out with 15-year-olds? It's a motel party, baby. Like, only uh, uh, Marshall was the one who was like, hey, let's bring a bunch of underage girls to this shindig. And everybody was like, I guess, can we fuck them? It's 1982. Is that allowed yet? What do we do? And he's like, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah, it's fine. Um, It's fine. You know, here's the thing. It's my sister, so take it slow. Or don't. She needs to learn. (laughs) <laughs> so George is played by Kyle T. Hefner, who put in his IMDb bio that Gary Marshall is his guardian angel. Oh. Yeah, why not? Um, he got his first job in the medical drama parody, Young Doctors in Love. Have you seen it? No. It's basically like, uh, like uh, Airplane meets Grey's Anatomy. Ooh, that sounds good. Yeah, 1982. He did this, then he did Flashdance. And uh, this guy's worked steadily ever since, often in TV, but he's shown up uh, as Gary, his guardian angel's namesake, in When Harry Met Sally. He was bizarro. Oh, my God. You're going to you're going to die. You're going to you're going to die. OK, so I have in my notes that he played. Bizarro George Costanza in a Seinfeld. Ha <laughs> That's the sound of your death. Ha <laughs> ha! Like a bird. Um, <laughs> yes, like my bird sweatshirt. Thank you to my husband who bought me this wonderful sweatshirt that has birds of prey on it. <laughs> shout out to birds. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so I can't believe he was Bizarro George Costanza and you literally called him George Costanza-esque. Um, he popped up on Desperate Housewives, Days of Our Lives, Curb Your Enthusiasm. Um, he's consistently working, currently filming a movie called The Downside of Bliss with Eric Roberts, Billy Zane, and Judd Nelson, so you know it's going to be good. Oh, yeah, that sounds yeah. great. Yes, um, I'll watch anything with Eric Roberts, to be honest. George explains the concept of subtext to Natalie. Yes. And I'm hoping and- she's going to go take a tr- quick trip to, over to the writer's room and share what she's learned. I literally wrote down the exact same thing. I was like, these these writers somehow basically explained, you know, you've got to write below the surface. We're t- looking for depth. We're talking about subtext. And I was like, so you're, you know what, what, what writing is, but you apparently can't take your own advice, Jerry Mayer. I think he thinks he's doing it. Yeah, but th- the other great thing is that when he <laughs> says, when, when George says this, he makes a gesture that I found so repellent that it reminded me of, um, and I tried to put it into words. He says, you know, you need, we're talking about subtext. And it's this like, it's like an asshole closing after pushing something out or like a octopus fleeing, you know, it's like swimming away. It was so repellent, and he was saying this to a 15-year-old. I don't think I... I mean, look, I think that you're um, reading beneath the surface. <laughs> but, uh, well, yes, but uh, that's what we are here for. George goes on to call J.D. Salinger intellectually constipated post-catcher in the rye. And I'm like, Jerry Mayer, you did not. Yeah, I was like, what the hell's <laughs> happening here? He st- and he starts telling her about J- J.D. Salinger being intellectually constipated. That Not only is that factually incorrect, 
Yeah, I agree. I love Franny and Zoe. And Ray High the room be- Roof Beam Carpenters, you know, and Seymour, whatever. I love all that shit. He kept producing. He wrote for the rest of his life. He wrote so much that his kid and his estate are going through his, his archives to see what they can now publish of his, now that he's dead. He, I would he, be excited to read anything. Of course. So I have a couple things that I wanted to say about J.D. Salinger because Please, it's, just such, means. it's such a, like, cause I was like, you know, I haven't actually gone down a little rabbit hole on J.D. Salinger in a while. Um, so again, he was a very, obviously very famous recluse, right? Mm-hmm. Um, um, but um, he was also, um, he was friends with Hemingway, whom he met during the second world war. Um, and during the Second World War, he was actually at Utah Beach during D-Day, uh, the Battle of the Bulge, among others, and was part of counterintelligence, um, where he, you know, it, uh, would say, not tortured, but interviewed POWs from the opposite side, because he he was fluent in French and German. Um, um, but he was, and like, you know, and I don't want to like, you know, end on a sad note, which I won't, but... Um, he, um, he was Jewish, um, and was part of the, um, armed for U S armed forces that did liberate or enter, uh, Dachau. And he said that the scent of rotting, he had PTSD after the second world war. And he said, the scent of rotting flesh is something that you'll never forget. Um, so I think that, and again, part of that, I think led to, he was, he always was writing, but that's why he always wrote very young people because I think, because he, he, his big thing was that adulthood and all the things that we believe in once we get older, they're all phony, they're nonsense, they're bullshit. So I think that he was very disillusioned by many things, but I'm going to not end on a, on a sad note about, you know, <laughs> concentration camps and the scent of burning flesh, but, um, cool. he, uh, he, uh, <clears throat> in, in, uh, night in, he dated Una O'Neill, who was Eugene O'Neill's, uh, daughter who then went on to marry Charlie Chaplin. But, and he, he famously described Una O'Neill as being very obsessed with Una O'Neill. Um, I but, mean, who isn't? Who isn't? I mean, oh no, Neil. I mean, God. Um, but the other great thing about him is that in 1941, um, he took a he took a job. He worked on a Carnival cruise ship as the activity director and was a performer on the cruise ship. Would anyone have associated being a cruise ship performer? With J.D. Salinger. No, but what did he perform? I don't know. You know, stand-up comedy? You know, ventriloquism? Who the fuck knows? I don't know. Uh, what it makes a big difference. Well, again, th- th- this was not clear on his wiki page. So maybe that was something that he was like, this is why I'm a recluse. It's too embarrassing to admit. You need to dig beneath the surface. Ah, uh, yes. Of his wiki page. Yeah. <laughs> find out what he performed on this cruise ship. <laughs> Um, so a motorcycle pulls up. Yes. And Tootie shouts like an insane person that Joe is arriving, even though nobody knows Joe. Nobody gives a fuck about Joe. Joe's not the one bringing the beer or the Coke or whatever. It's it's just Joe. Nobody cares. But this does make Marshall think of his favorite asshole game to play. Yeah. Kamikaze quiz. You ever play this? No. You ever hear of it? No, because it doesn't exist. Okay, good. I never heard of it either. So, um, please. so because because so Kamikaze Quiz. He so Tootie's like, I love quizzes. I love quiz games. How are we gonna play? And then he explains it's actually a drinking game, where you know you when a new person enters the party, while they ask questions, every time they ask a question, you take a sip of your drink. And then when they ask the question, why are you doing this or why, you have to chug a lug. It's a lot of chug a lug happening in this episode. And so, you know, and again, I was, as I was watching this, I was like, what the fuck are we, what is this? And I Googled it and it's, no, that doesn't exist. But also the point of drinking games is not to get drunk yourself. I mean, 
overall, if you're playing a drinking game, everyone wants to get wasted. But the goal of a drinking game is to get your opponent drunk and obliterated. So this makes no sense. None at all. Also, like, the goal of this game seems to just be to irritate the newcomer. Yes. And nothing else. No. There's no other goal. Um, no, Natalie gets so permission to pr play with diet root beer. Diet. I know. I wrote that down. I wrote down, why? They could have just done root beer. Yeah, I thought so, too. I thought that was needlessly, you know, cruel. As yeah, usual. It seemed unnecessary. Um, also, she's drinking it from a weird glass barrel. I wonder, is this how, like, she just demanded, I want my root beer to be served in an adorable barrel so it feels barrel-aged? No, no, no. So, and I wrote down, I, so what I noticed is that all around the room, so basically, these, this, you know, college ski club party or whatever, they're drinking all these brewskis. Clearly, it looks like Bud, Budweiser. They look like cans of Bud. Um, it, I mean, it might have been Greeked out, but it was very clear. It was... Red and white, red, white, and black, right? So, um, red, white, and bro. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so, very obviously, Tootie is drinking out of a big glass um, bottle that's clearly orange soda. And so does uh, Natalie, has a big one of brown soda. So, it's clear they're trying to make it obvious that these kids are not drinking beer because that's not this week's fact we've already learned that fact yes that's why natalie gets permission to yeah. drink diet root beer um anyway joe uh is about to arrive george shushes everybody and reminds them not to tell joe what they're doing no shit george okay everybody shh. don't tell joe what we're doing we we only discussed this game up until you interrupted us to tell us not yeah. like, George, George, yeah. get your shit together. So Joe ends up asking more questions than she ever has in the history of Joe. Yeah. Um, most of them are pizza related, to be fair. And honestly, they're all good questions. You know, is there any pizza left? Drink. Good question. Mm -hmm. What kind of pizza is this? Drink. What's on this pizza? Drink. Is there something weird on this pizza? Drink. They're yes. all laughing their asses off. Until she finally says why. And then chug it's, it's all supremely not hilarious, but I did a pizza pun. Oh. Wow, yeah. yeah. I love a nice pizza pun. Um, so Tootie can't stand it. She just can't. Yeah, it's too, it's too intense. It's, Keeping this from Joe is too intense. It's too crazy. It's too hilarious. This is too so, much fun. It's I too I much. I, I have to ruin this. I, I can't stop laughing. I might die. We have to end this right yeah. now. <laughs> uh, so she tells Joe what's going on, and Joe and nobody is amused. Yeah. Uh, and now it's later on at the party. Yep. Uh, Natalie and George are discussing literature. Yeah. Natalie is telling Manly how refreshing it is to be discussing literature with a college man. And then he, like a, like all college men, vomits, vomit in his in own, face. vomits in his own mouth and then swallows it. Right. It's better than spewing it on Natalie. Uh, yeah. I mean, to be perfectly frank, Natalie sh should be pleased that Bizarro George didn't vomit all over her because that might have, you know, made her I think not want to <laughs> Made her not want to go to journalism school. There is no evidence uh, that Natalie is not pleased that she was not vomited on by Bizarro George. Sure. Paul Walsh is drunkenly going on about how he's going to get someone big like Orson Welles to be on his network. Yeah, and then they make a series of fat jokes. Oh, he's big. Yeah, he is big, but like in 1982, we're kind of like, do you choose Delta Burke? Like, I don't know. Nobody knew who Delta Burke was Whatever. then. She was still a beauty queen. She wasn't I don't know, big Fat yet. Fat Albert? Whatever. I don't know. Fat Albert. Whatever. Get, when I'm a network executive, I'm going to get Fat Albert to read Moby Dick on a stool, page by page. So, but so the, the funniest is. So. <laughs> So the funny thing about this is that he's like, is that like, you know, Wacko is, or Wacko. 
That's Wacko that's, Walsh. Wacko Walsh. Wacko is, Jr. Wacko Jr. is like, I got a really good idea. So when I'm head of my cable network, I'm going to have someone real big read every page. I'm going to have them sit on a stool and read every page of Moby Zick. This feels like a cocaine idea rather than an alcohol idea. I'm just going to say I'm putting it out there, but otherwise, sure. Yeah, this is the weirdest thing because <laughs> it's like it's it's and then they make a series of like, I'm going to get someone really big. Oh, like Orson Welles. And it's like, yeah, he's big. You're going to need two stools to support him. I thought they were going to go. I thought they were going to go the third beat and do like, well, you can't have too many cameras on him because they really add on the pounds. No, no. They were anyway. done. They, they realized this was a failing line of humor. But again, the other crazy thing is that um, is that uh, is is that why make a joke about Orson Welles on this show? <laughs> In nineteen eighty two, that's what all the kids are thinking about. All the fourteen year old girls they have all the Orson Welles pinups on their walls. They just that's who they know. <laughs> that's that's what they understand. I agree. Oh. Sorry, my, sorry, sorry for everyone listening. My cat is doing something bad. <laughs> oh, well, while her cat does something bad, let me tell you that uh, Marshall gets a phone call because there's this, like, weird, I would say, network of people who call each other to be like, hey, there's a motel party just yes. down the street. So this is how they got this information pre-internet that there's another hotel party that they have to get to. And this one has fucking music. Oh, shit. M can you imagine music at a hotel? That was what this hotel party was missing. They oh, had sure. two kinds of soda, beer. They pizza. had hilarious party games and pizza and underage girls. They, the only thing they're missing, music. Music, which that strikes me as something you probably couldn't actually acquire, like a radio or maybe the television that you could just turn on in a motel room. Usually there's like a tape deck or something. like I, one, one, one would think. Yeah. I'm sorry. I just wanted to just mention one last thing about Orson Welles that I know. Um, that um, in 1986, he, which was one of his last roles, speaking of how fat he is. <laughs> He was, he, he voiced the, he was in the Transformers movie and he voiced the, um, the, the, uh, a villain named Unicron, who is a robot villain so large that he's planet sized. Oh, I assumed he was a eunuch or a unicorn or both. Un, very, very un, uh, little known fact. Unicorns are eunuchs. Oh, is that how they got their name? Yes. Ah, that makes sense. Tune um, in to my other podcast, Unicorn Facts. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have facts about regular eunuchs or just the mythical ones? Just, just unicorns. Okay. Um, anyway, so they're going to go to this music motel party. Um, and Marshall's like, um, like any newly 18-year-old guy is excited to bring his 13-year-old sister right. to yet another creepy motel for some drinking. No, so he says, he goes, yeah, there's, you know, he's like, I just got off the phone. There's going to be a new party, another party, and another motel, and they have music. Yeah. And, like, Tootie's like, listen, uh, it's getting kind of late. I think I might want to go. You know, we got to get back. I, you know, it's almost, it's 930. We got to get back by 10. That's curfew. Um and Marshall's like, he's like, come on, I want to dance with my little sister, which is a sentence no human has ever said in their life. In a motel. In a motel with drunk people. And maybe more pizza. Maybe more pizza. Uh, yeah, no, that was weird. Their relationship is odd. Yeah. Um, did you know that in 1983, the drinking age was raised to 20? I didn't know that. Yeah, shortly after this episode, honestly. Was um, it because of this episode? I, I like to think that it was. So it was Why raised not? from 18 to 20, and then in 1985, it was raised one more year to 21. There you go. Good. Yeah. Um, I always just think of it as 21 all the time, so it's interesting to know that it wasn't. Uh, Marshall understands, even though he's a little disappointed that he won't be able to dance with Tootie, but then he trips over a table. And yeah, like grabbing a beer or something. Yeah. And then he's like, I'll drive you home. 
Then he yes. turns on some kind of weird special parking lot illuminating light that the motel offers. To show us the car, to show us the station wagon. And so, like, then Natalie and Blair and Tootie are sort of like, oh, shit, what are we going to do? And they're like, and then Blair, you know, who apparently is, you know, the at this point, the real idiot of the bunch is like, comes up with one of her amazing ideas. Brilliant. Brilliant ideas. And says, hey, Marshall. She always wants to drive a station wagon. I want I want to I want to fulfill my dream which is to drive a station wagon. Oh, again, God. again, another thing no one has ever said. Look, she had it's better than like what was the what was the one oh, Blair won't mind that it's Wednesday? Yes. <laughs> um she's not the quickest tool in the shed, assuming yes. that the tools are motorized. Yeah. Um anyway, Tootie like, shushes them. She's like one of those old-fashioned um, lawnmowers that you need to, like, vroom. Oh, vroom, she's one of those. Older. I like the older-fashioned ones where you just push. <laughs> just push. That's Blair. Um, so Tootie shushes them because she would rather kill Blair and Natalie than embarrass her brother in front of yes. her friends. Um, he shakes all the empty beer cans looking for one last can to tide him over on the 15-minute-long drive to Yorktown. I did Google map it. Mm, how long is it? 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Yes. Uh, Blair asks him if uh, he's going to drink and drive simultaneously. And he's like, I'm not crazy. And then he chug yeah. hugs somebody's beer that was just like left over somewhere. Uh, and nobody even said the secret word. Why? No. He's cheating a kamikaze quiz. Well, um, yeah. So um, at this point, I would like to pause and remark on... This is where no we're going. Pausing. You're just going to say other stuff. No, gonna... I, I meant I meant pause the the discussion from moving forward from here. Um, um, pausing is, tape. Got it. Yes. Is I would like to. Uh, this is this is where the second vest comes into play. Ah, vest alert. Vest alert. So uh, this is our second vesticle, um, and it's I would say the most egregious of them. The vest laid plans. Yes, it is horrifying. When, uh, you know, you texted me saying, you ready to go? I said, um, I sent you a screen cap of this image. And I said, I might be slightly late because I need to wash my eyes after having seen what they put Natalie in, in this scene. And then we did. We started an hour late. Yeah, but that was because of your internet problems. No, we started a half hour late because you were washing your eyes out, and then my internet blanked out. <laughs> okay, so we're both at fault. Anyway, sure. <laughs> okay, so Natalie is wearing, they. so the costume department clearly fucking hates her because they put her in a, they do. a red, poofy, silky, sleeved, she looked like a, like, um, what do they call it? Like, um, like nothing I've ever seen before. No, it's like, um, those, like those, uh, um, like a Russian dancer, you know, in like those big, big red sleeves, like, you know, it's in, it's a huge red silk shirt. And then they put this brown, black and white, horizontal striped wool vest on her. <laughs> That is buttoned up to below where her breasts are. So it makes her breasts look extraordinarily low, like they start at her navel, but also like they're almost pushed behind her into her back. They're, they're so like one end. They're so wide. It's like, you know, you know how they have like a push up bra? This was a push out bra. It's like it was so ugly and so bad. I was like, I was shocked. I, you know, I actually thought this was this was such a cruel outfit that they put her in that, like, it was a hate crime. My I I felt like my eyes got raped. Like they should put the costumer, like she should be, like whoever it is should be like on a firm timeout. You know, this was really ugly. Like it was like, you know, a prison guard's day off here. 
Yeah, I, I have no, I have nothing to add except that I was just overwhelmed by the ugliness. But I feel like, and also that her boobs seem to be like one entity, like just no. like a, a mound. No, they were they were low and far, so that it looked as though she had an she had a um um an inflatable tube around her waist. That's yeah. It was, but that was like oddly. It was like forced on her by the vest. It was a malevolent vest. Oh, the malevolent vest. All right. So, um, anyway, uh, Paul, significantly less hunky now. Paul Walsh. Yes. Shows up wearing, wearing, wearing that very sexy shearling coat, all done up wrong. Yeah. <laughs> he buttoned it. He buttoned it like he was putting it on in the dark upside down. And was wasted. <laughs> it's like, what drunk person's like, well, I'm walking one foot to the car that I can see. I better button all these buttons. I know I'm yeah. drunk, but I'm going to get this. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway. Uh, and he's like, he's like, if it would make you feel better, I'll drive you. It's yeah. fine. I'm good. And like, the audience laughs. Like, I was, I wrote down, like, I love it when. It's like for a very special episode about drunken driving, they're kind of treating this like, like, that's a joke. That's a laugh. The audience was like, ha ha, good. This guy clearly can't drive, but the other one, maybe, he seems okay. That's what boys do. Mm -hmm. 18-year-old boys is why they had to raise the drinking level. Um, Age, the drinking level. Um, Yeah, so anyway, it's good that they don't want Paul Walsh to drive because Paul Walsh has to go barf in the bathroom again. Um, There are a lot of red flags concerning this car ride. We learn the whereabouts of the missing Joe. She left early because this was not her scene. She knows herself. Um, She's on her way to Marie Thornwell to Mm -hmm. uh, watch some Lawrence Welk. Fortunately, Mm -hmm. Tootie points out that um, Joe does not know how to have a good time because Tootie does not know what happens when the bubbles start flowing. (laughs) Anyway, uh, Blair laments that uh, she didn't get on the back of Joe's bike, grab life by the boobies. Mm -hmm. Um, And Marshall is honking from the parking lot. (laughs) It's like, he was one second. There's everybody is still in the, you're the (laughs) only one who left, bro. I know. And the great thing is, is also because of the way that set is designed, as you pointed out, you can you can see the car visibly through the sliding door window, like the glass doors, right? Yes. And it's three feet away. It's so close, right? And you can just see him like leaning on the horn, like eh, 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 eh. and it's just like he can see what's going on inside. He could just come back in. So he's pulling like a real asshole move of just leaning on the horn to get these girls to come out. But there's live music they have to get to they, Yeah, town. we got to get there. We got to get there for that. That's true. <laughs> anyway, um, Blatterly have to decide uh, that they decide they're going to walk to the nearest taxi, which yeah. automatically causes Tootie to flip out and so, say, and I'm, go I'm, ahead, I'm, ruin Marshall's visit for me. I won't enjoy it unless he injures at least one of my friends. Yeah. So, again, why at this point will no one call Mrs. Garrett? You don't need a taxi. You don't need to walk home. Just call Mrs. Garrett. They weren't doing anything wrong. Everyone who was, who was drinking was of legal age. They weren't drinking. They, yeah. were, part, they were eating pizza. Yeah. It's fine. They're at a hotel. They can get a cab. They yeah. don't have to walk to the nearest taxi. They literally go ding dong at the front desk. Can you get a taxi for me? I'm Blair Warner. I have endless money and I only need to go, what, three minutes? Yeah. 15 minutes. <laughs> well, no, they were 15 minutes to Yorktown. I don't know. Oh. I assume they were at the. Oh, yes. I assume they yes. were just at the Peekskill Lodge or something. Yes, of course. Um. Anyway, smash cut to the lounge. No, or- hold on. Hold on. Oh. I, have pa- I have to pause you there. Please. So as soon as Tootie says, she says, you know, go ahead and ruin Marshall's visit for me, right? <clears throat> Tootie says, my favorite, and by favorite, I mean my least favorite and most hated line in all teen dramas, teen sitcom dramas, teen movies, 
which is, you guys are supposed to be my friends. I hate that so much because it is asking for loyalty over nothing, over safety. And it's like, you're ask, you like, you guys are supposed to be my friends? That doesn't teach you what being a friend is. I mean, neither does the facts of life. Yeah, no shit. Uh, but, uh, yeah, well, we, so she forces, we leave with 2D forcing her friends to get in the car with a drunken brother behind the wheel. Mm-hmm. And we smash cut to the lounge where Joe is trying to track him down. Yeah, she's on the phone, and she's yeah. talking to George. And here, let me pause you here. Here is where our next next vest is. This vest, this look, was so iconic. I I couldn't believe it because she would. They put so before when she when Joe came in um, into the pizza party. She was wearing her leather jacket and, you know, a T-shirt under whatever, like a, you know, athletic T-shirt. The costume department decided to change it up into her inside denim vest, which is, you know, the vest you wear when you need to have all of your items, you know, like your carabiners, your vibrators, your, you know, your, I don't know, whatever, your, your motorcycle key. It was, this seems, this look was, seems to me that it should be in queer canon because this looked so like butch and sexy and Joe looked great in it, but it was such an aggressive shift from like, oh yeah, she's just wearing her leather jacket to being like, no, no, no. We're not talking subtext here. This is text. Well, you know, when you know when you leave your friends in a situation where they're most likely going to be driven home by an alcohol-fueled teenager. Yes. It's best to get home and relax in your best utility vest. Yeah. Mhm. While you wait for them to return. And if something goes wrong, you have all those pockets so you can go, you know, take your motorcycle have, through have, the streets, see if you can fix their car if that's the problem. You know, she's got she's got her rape whistle. She's got her utility, as you said. You know, like smelling a, salts smelling to get salt. him out of out of the the drunken stupor. Yeah, you yeah, you know, uh, a, a Swiss Army knife. You know, the jaws of death. You know, she's got all of that shit in in that vest of hers. I, it was quite something. I thought I was looking at the lead singer of Blues Traveler. <laughs> That's uh, John Papa, is that correct? Popper. Popper? Popper? Okay, um, John Popper. Uh, so apparently George is too drunk to really know anything else. Um, they left over an hour ago. George not into parties with music? No. Well, he was asleep when they left. Remember, he was passed out? Fair enough, fair enough. Um, frustrated, Joe quotes E.T. and then hangs up on him, storms yeah. into the cafeteria, as one does. Yeah. A weird choice. Uh, Mrs. Garrett comes in and Joe tries to ease her worries by saying they just left. They should be here soon. Mrs. Garrett doesn't think it's like Tootie to be late. The other bitches, sure, but Tootie is a narky do-gooder. She's never late. Yeah. She's doing something really important, like forcing her friends to get into a car with her drunk brother behind the wheel. Yeah, and so so now, so Mrs. Garrett comes in with a blanket and is, here's why Joe came streaming out of the la lounge so quickly. It's because she cares about her fucking broccoli that's in the middle of the cafeteria that might freeze to death all night. That is true. She and is. so she comes in. She comes streaming in. Also, broccoli, member of the Brassica family. <laughs> um, I but love all not, But oh. not a cabbage. So all cabbages are brassicas, but no, not all brassicas are cabbage. Actually, you know, here's the thing. I'm 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 ninety nine percent sure right th sure that that uh, broccoli is a brassica but i'm not 100 percent. so please do not at me everyone um anyway so she comes in and she covers for them being like yeah they left they, they just left i found out even though they left an hour ago so she is covering for them right mm -hmm. and so but mrs garrett comes in being like this is so unlike tootie um with a blanket because 
Joe is freaking out that her broccoli is going to freeze. So she brought it into the cafeteria and is going to use Mrs. Garrett's wool blanket to warm it up. Okay, so now, now, now here's where Miss Horticulture over here is going to explain. That's not how this works. Just get like, you know, do they not have a fucking sun lamp or something? Also, it's in a greenhouse. It's and fine. She, she also said that she spent good money on fertilizer and she doesn't want it to go to waste. Basically saying, like, I bought all this shit and I don't want it to go to waste, so I'm going to use your nice wool blanket, Mrs. Mrs. Garrett, to keep them warm. It was, it was like, what? It was like, Jerry Mayer was like, okay, fuck, I forgot I invented this whole bok choy thing. Ugh, is there another plant? we got to give her some business to do. Uh, Brit. Yes? Broccoli. Broccoli? It's a brassica. Oh, thank you. You're very welcome. <laughs> Um, anyway, so, uh, Joe's bra- blanketing her broccoli, um, faster than you can say rotting chicken manure, which is what <laughs> they say, as Blair enters the cafeteria, and then Mrs. Garrett says, oh, we were just talking about you. And Blair's like, she looks at her like she's gonna kill her. She's like, what? As though, they, as though like, they've you been You call me rotting chicken manure behind my back? Yes. That's what you've been doing? How, how dare you? <laughs> <clears throat> um, Natoots enters behind shortly thereafter. They look a little out of whack. They clearly. look a little shaken. They look yeah. a little shaken. Clearly there's been an accident. Yeah. Um, uh, but Tootie has come up with a lie that the car wouldn't get started, so they had to walk home. And yeah. uh, Marshall's back working on the car. Mm-hmm. Um, but Nat is showing none of the normal buoyancy that she usually has. No. So so they, so they when when all of this lying is happening, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, Natalie is not talking, and, but she has come in. She's shaken. She's sitting down, right? Um, and she looks so guilty. She looks like a little dog that got her head caught in the kibble container, ate it all, and now has the container stuck around her head like a little baby astronaut. And she's just like, I don't, uh oh. Very specific. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Did I, did I do that? Like, it's, she's just like, oh no, we're going to get in trouble. For what? For getting in a car with a drunk driver? For not pushing back? I, no. Yeah, I would feel like I would be getting in trouble if I was in her situation, to be fair. Um, but Joe knows what's up. She can see through the lie. And so she orders four hot chocolates from Mrs. Garrett. So she could have a word alone with the survivors. Yes. Um, and as loud as she's ever been with Mrs. Garrett in the other room, she decides to scream, you've been in an accident? Yes. Like, very, like, like the hot chocolate maker is loud enough that nobody's going to hear. Very, very concerned single mom energy. Yes, that is true. Uh, Blair explains he went too fast. He ran a red light. Another car was coming at them. Everybody screamed. They ran off the road, knocking over a small, thanks to the tree. Mm-hmm. Yes. It was a tree. And Tootie was like, small tree. Like, okay, yeah, it's better. Thanks, Tootie. Yeah, and so, and, and Nat- Natalie keeps saying that her leg won't stop shaking, and she's and, very upset. She's Her knee won't stop shaking. She's visibly very upset. Yeah, and this so- is where she very, this is like, like terms of endearment acting. She's like, why won't my knee stop shaking? Yes. And Very which intense. Was, which was apparently convincing enough for Joe to do something that I've never seen on this show ever, which was go and comfort someone in need. Yes, she did do that. She went over and hugged her like she was, you know, she just learned that she got has cancer. She, this was, a, as you said, very terms of endearment. It was very intense. Yeah. Um, Marshall comes in and he's happy. Like, uh, uh, like he didn't just nearly kill his sister and two of her friends on a tree. Yeah. Um, he put a bandaid on his forehead that screams, I'm a drunk driver. Yes. I'm surprised he didn't have one of those foam neck braces that people, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, but, um, that people use to like defraud insurance companies yeah, or whatever. That's the only reason they're used. But <laughs> yes, of course not. But, um, 
Tootie is like, she's minimizing everyone's feelings before Marshall enters. She's like, it was a small tree. It wasn't that bad. Natalie, why are you acting like this? It's fine. It's fine. And Blair's like, we could have been killed. And Tootie's like, shut the fuck up. What the hell's the matter with you? Put on your broccoli blanket and shut the fuck up. (laughs) Yeah, she's minimizing. Like, this is, this is literal sociopathic behavior. To minima to gaslight people into be- into not remembering into misremembering reality. Yeah, it's like a real asshole. Speaking of assholes, Marshall is being an asshole. He's blaming the crossing. There should have been a warning sign at the crossing. Oh, you there mean that a- stoplight that he ran? Yeah, that was a traffic light. Is that not warning sign enough for you, you <laughs> idiot? Yeah. Uh, Tootie's still defending him. These Ramseys should just go fuck off. She calls it an accident, and Natalie goes, that's no accident, that's five beers. And I'm sorry, it's also an accident. Yes, but I will say this. As soon as she said that, that second laugh, that was my second laugh of the of the episode. What? Which one? That was no accident. That was <laughs> five beers! I, sh- I shrieked with laughter. because I re- And I also wrote down... New catchphrase alert. That was no accident. That was five beers. I love it. <laughs> five beers! And I wrote down, and honestly, like, I was like, five beers, like, yeah, you shouldn't, that's buzz driving. You shouldn't be driving. And yes, the roads are slick. I looked it up, the blood alcohol level, like, if you're if you're over .08 in New York City, in New York State, that is being a drunk driver. And if this guy, you know, weighs around 200 pounds and had he five beers- not. He weighs like 160. Okay, so. And he's 18. No, he's 21. No, he's um, 18. Oh. No, that's impossible because he's Phi Beta Kappa. You can only get into that if you're a senior. Oh, okay. Then he's 21. <laughs> um, anyway, his blood alcohol level would have been elevated and he would have been arrested. So, yes, it is true. But like five beers, like it should have been like, you drank a case of beer in five beers. Like that's small beer compared. Like it doesn't. It's like that's not that's that small big. beer. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I feel like I could probably um, I mean, I feel <laughs> like that kid is so thin and young that five beers could affect him. Of course. Like, and also you know, the you know, elevation in peak skill. Sure. It's yes, it's incredibly it's like 10,000 feet over the, over the, you know, above sea level. No, but again, like I'm not trying to minimize that, but like, you know, like two is. Yes, like two is. But like if you're as a, if you're going to do an, a very special episode about drinking while driving, make it more serious. I Raise think the, the point here is that even five beers is sure. drunk. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. But he doesn't. He There's says, clearly a lesson that I believe Jer- Jerry Mayer was told as a child was like, I'm not drunk. It's just beer. Yeah. I've never heard that. Like, it's not true. I don't like, know. Is that how you feel? No, of yeah. course not. I feel like beer, you can get drunk on beer. It's, yes. It's, it's not, there's no quantity in the equation. I'm not drunk, it's just beer. And so I feel like this is, uh, th- this is a message that Jerry Mayer had as a child and believed and then one day learned was wrong and was like, that is the fact this week. Sure, okay. Um, anyway, Mrs. Garrett enters with some, oh wait, hang on. Uh, Tootie admits that it was awful finally. Um, but it's all over now, and so yeah. they need to keep the secret from Mrs. Garrett, so they should really stop screaming at the top of their lungs, Joe. But Blair points out that it's not over, because Marshall is about to go to another party, which he denies. Yeah, he says, no, I'm not. Honest, going, I'm going to go back to the motel slowly. And then Mrs. Garrett all enters. Right. Mrs. Garrett enters. Marshall, did you get the car started? We were so worried about you. What happened to your head? Because she, from the second she saw it, she was like, "Oh, that's the telltale sign of a drunk driver. She's, he's got a forehead bandage." She no, but as I said, here's the thing about Mrs. Also, Garrett. Also, Judy's bad acting. Yes, Those two but, things. Yes, but um, Mrs. Garrett is like all bubble, all bubbles and excitement, and like, "Oh, I'm so excited to give my girls hot chocolate, and excited to see Marshall has delivered my girls home." And she's like, "Marshall, Marshall, Marshall," and then. Because of the dramatic tone, she spots the bandage, right? It's, what happened to your head? And that is the extent of Mrs. Garrett's acting in this episode. It's just vocal work. It's just vocal work. She She does it with with Tootie later. 
Um, she tries to get him to stay for some hot chocolate, but he jokes, no thanks, I'm driving. Yeah, and the audience laughs. Yeah. The audience... <laughs> read the room, the audience. I know you are the room, but read it better. So that's the great thing, is it? so... I, the there it got it got a couple titters in the audience right of people who either had just woken up who had been asleep for the first 18 minutes of this episode or, or or had been drinking themselves it is possible they did like a theme thing where they just passed out some brewskis to the audience, yeah. <laughs> keep them laughing, even though nothing funny happens except, you know, for the the it's no accidents, five beers that you love so much. Um, anyway, uh, Mrs. Garrett looks like he's going to she's going to slit his throat when he says, no, thanks. I'm driving. Yeah. And then he leaves. Oh, he leaves. And, yes, this is and the, she's like, bye. Go drive. This, drunk. Yeah. This is the creepiest, the worst part. How does he leave? He says goodbye to Tootie. He cradles her face oh, yes. with both hands, and it literally looks as though he's going to tongue kiss her. Mm-hmm. Or it's like the last time they're ever going to see each other. But yes, it is it so was, romantic. As I said, flowers in the attic. Very alarming. It was gross. <laughs> Um, Bladdily decides to take their empty prop mugs of hot chocolate and head upstairs. Like, if you're going to give them hot chocolate, either put the camera so we can't see inside the mugs, or just just put hot chocolate in the mugs and hope that they can walk. It doesn't even have to be hot. Make it chocolate milk. We can't tell the temperature. It doesn't matter. We can tell when they're empty. Here's the thing. Put some fucking marbles in there. Doesn't matter. Put a rock in there. Um, yeah, so they decide to take their empty mugs upstairs, and Joe follows because she wants her bro- broccoli blanket, not because she cares about Blair's well-being. Being. Bealing. Broccoli blanket bleeing. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> J- Jessica Bealing. Um, <laughs> the show just wants to make this perfectly clear. She needs a broccoli blanket. Yeah. And because, then... I'll... Because that's the only thing she has. Yes, this week. She's like, I'm not, I'm not stupid enough to go and get in the car with a drunk driver, so I have bok choy. Bok choy. I, and listen, broccoli. If I'm going to come out of this in one piece, I need my fucking broccoli blanket. That's the one thing I need. <laughs> you have a modicum of respect. So now, alone with Mrs. Garrett, Tootie uh, gets grilled. Yeah. She, Ms. So, so Mrs. Garrett menacingly, like, rumbles at her. Tootie, let's talk. And I was like, again, Mrs. Garrett, like, it's like, you know, she doesn't, she's not acting. It's just this, like, she does this thing where it's like, and then, you know, it's like this, there's no middle ground between bubbly Mrs. Garrett and like, you know, Satan. (laughs) <laughs> fair enough fair enough um so uh she does ask if he was drinking and Tootie lies and then corrects herself he had beers but he wasn't drunk yeah this is a, garrett is an expert on drunk hunks she was married to one mm-hmm. and it was just beer and beer is an alcohol apparently she's heard that too before okay <clears throat> so yeah so she says again in this whole sequence where where Tootie is Con- confronting the fact that she willingly put her friends in danger and herself because she was unwilling to confront the bad behavior of a cherished, well-respected older brother. Slash lover. Slash lover. Um, and so she's basically trying to deny it and trying to rationalize it, basically saying, like, he's fine, you know, you know, um... It's okay, you know, um, you know, there wasn't an accident. And then Mrs. Garrett goes, oh, Tootie, please. I saw Marshall. I know that look. And then pauses dramatically. And then this is where I thought, okay, great. Here we go. Congratulations for making it about yourself, Mrs. Garrett. Here we go. Yeah. Unfortunately, I'm sort of an expert. And I was like, oh, really? Drunk driving expert? You know, you you drive too like this, Mrs. Garrett? You know the look? She goes, my husband was never drunk either. You know, and then, yeah, as you said, um, 
Mrs. Garrett, the Tootie says, Mrs. Garrett, it was just beer. And then it's like in her most like wobbly, drunk Muppet voice. Just beer. Yeah, well, she's heard that before. People have said just beer to her. She gets it. Um, yeah, so basically, uh, Mrs. Garrett wants to know why Tootie didn't call her for a ride. And she said it was Friday night. She's right in the middle of Dallas, which is 100% factual because Dallas was on at 9 o'clock on Fridays. Okay, so they got one point for accuracy in terms of knowing time slots for television shows. Time slots and bok choy. <laughs> uh, Mrs. Garrett threatens to tell Tootie's folks, considering it was their car, and Tootie freaks out. Then Rifle Ramsey won't let Marshall take the car to Florida for spring break. Yeah, no, this is my favorite thing. She, so she's like, you know, Mrs. Garrett basically like changes tactics from being like, I, you know, isn't Breer alcohol? You know, in her marble mouth, whatever. And then being like, your parents deserve to know they own that car. She just, she changes tactics being like, I'm going to call them. Like, you know, even though he's 21, you know, but they deserve to know. And it's, and then Judy shrieks, are you crazy? Yeah, um, yeah. because she really needs Marshall to go to spring break. Yeah. Because there's a lot of sexual things that he wants to do with her, and she's just not ready for it. And so he was going to try him out, get good at it at spring break, and then come back and deliver yeah. the goods to his sister. That's, That's um, why. And Mrs. Garrett chastises Tootie for being an enabler. If she loves her brother, she should knock on him. She knocks on anybody else anyway. Exactly. And now we are back at the Pizza and Beer Motel on yes. Route 66. Which I, you know, when I, so they open on the open pizza box that has like half a slice left in it and like, you know, like can, empty cans of Budweiser or whatever. Um, you know, Budweiser. That, <laughs> Budweiser. That didn't, yes, that didn't strike me as continuity because Tootie had been clearly, was clearly cleaning up around everyone earlier. So did they have another party? Yeah, I think oh, they had okay. a couple. <laughs> okay. I, I would assume. After, you mean they had an, these these older men had another party after the tw the 12 year olds left? Yeah, after the 12 years left at 930, they went to that <laughs> other party with music. Which yes. Well, they could stay there for another, like, it's probably, what, 10, 15 now? They could probably stay there until, you know, midnight and then go back and have a whole other pizza party delivered. Fair enough. Yes, that makes sense. Anyway, um, <clears throat> Marshall answers, still in his clothes from the night before. He obviously went to the second party, the prick. Um, he was supposed to come visit Tootie in the morning. She had yeah. to take the goddamn bus over like a freaking normal Without <laughs> a special brother that can drive her around drunk. Uh, Mrs. Garrett was also like, you know, you could ask me for a ride last night. Was she not available today? Apparently not. <clears throat> you think? Um, anyway, so Tootie hems and haws and opens windows. She makes the bed. She for no reason. About, <laughs> complaining about the smell. <clears throat> she finally gets to the point. He has to tell mom and dad. Or yeah. Mrs. Garrett will. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> and he's like and she's like he's like, she's like you have to tell mom and dad and he's like okay you're fucking crazy and he's like it's fine like i'm just gonna get the car fixed and tell dad later in 1996 yeah and you know what he would say he'd be like hey dad in two years i'm gonna direct how stella got her groove back and also by the way i drunk drove 2d in 1983 sorry sorry Wow. Uh, Tootie's sounding like an insane person. She's like, yeah. you got to tell mom and dad. It's the right thing to do. Under no circumstances should they tell mom and dad. Yeah. And then he's like, well, you know, here's the thing. You don't understand. It's way more complicated than that. I had a DUI a couple you know, a couple months back. And oh, she's like, well, then that's fine. Now I get it. She's like, okay, well, obviously now we definitely have to conceal this fact. Yes, this seems yeah. like a systematic Please. problem. Okay, well, if if you have an established pattern of drinking while, while driving, then we need to keep this up. So, yes, I will support the illusion. That and also, you're could you define for me what DUI is? Yes. <laughs> uh, and then Paul Walsh comes in. Yeah, screaming, beer's here. 
Which again, also my second favorite new catchphrase. Beer's here. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, no, that's not as good as it's not an accident. It's five beers <laughs> here. We could probably combine them. Um, anyway, so um, yes, uh, we learned that Marshall did go to the second party last night. Tootie feels like she's been played for a fool. Yes. And Marshall sends Paul out into the cold uh, to try to figure out how to read a room. Mm -hmm. uh, Marshall explains that this isn't driving beer, just in case you thought. <laughs> you no, know, this isn't road beer. No, no, yeah. no. That's not what this is. That's this not what this is. Beer for the lodge, because they charge an arm and a leg at the ski lodge, and it's hard to ski with, you know, one arm and one leg, because the poles and the, you know, the skis. Yeah. And, like, and I think the audience was just like, get the fuck out of here. I hope you die in a crash. Yeah. But they that's, were like, that's you can't, that's feeling. enough. Please. As soon as you said that, they were like, Everything has shifted. I hate you now. Get out Maybe of here. That's why we never hear or see from Marshall again because he died off screen going to go get, like, you know, going to the slopes. Yeah. And they're like, fuck him. That's yeah, fine. Yeah. It's Marshall. Marshall. Not been worth an episode. Mar Marshall Ramsey, Paul Walsh, and Bizarro George, RIP, all died on en route to Lake Placid because of all these road beards. And this was after Joe's favorite teacher died last week. It's just Death Capital USA. <laughs> anyway, um, she calls him out for going to the party and getting drunk again. And he goes, it was beer. I never get drunk off of beer. Like, oh, we're just doing this again. Again and again, yeah. Um, uh, and she says, Marshall, we could have been killed. And he's like, and, you know, and she's like, you know, and she's, he's like, blah, blah, blah. And she says, you know, you don't, you didn't know what you were doing. You were trying to be macho, chug-a-lugging like everybody else. Yeah, and he's like, shut the fuck up, woman. Yeah. Uh, he wants to know what you're supposed to do. And she's like, call fucking mom and dad. And he's like, no. <laughs> and this this drags on for like a minute or two with them just being like back and forth. He's like, I'm packing up and I'm leaving. You know, do what you want. She's like, you need to call mom and dad. And he's like, no, I don't want to. And she's like, call mom and dad. You, I saw you chug a lugging. And he's like, I'm leaving. And she's like, you need to call mom and dad. Literally, yeah. he's out She has door. a good point, though. She's like, fine, I will carry the burden of worrying if you die for the rest of my life. It'll be my fault. Yeah. And he's still like, okay. Okay, that's fine. Actually, I don't mind. Yeah. I don't give a fuck just as long as you don't call mom and dad. Yeah. Um, but finally she says she will right now. And she he picks is, up the phone. He is. Uh, like the door is open. He's got both bags in his hands. Yeah, the one door, foot, literally one foot out the door. At this point, you know, I know where the car is. The car is out the side door. He could have used the glass door that is more convenient to the car. Nope. Less dramatic. Less dramatic. Um, but, uh, you know, you make a good point. You make a great point. Um, then, so then Tootie picks up the phone. Yeah. And, and and if, if I were him, I would literally just pull the cord. Yeah, I would, I would have, you know, pulled the cord and hit her in the face. Doesn't matter. Whatever. Yeah, take um, the receiver. Bam. <laughs> Problem solved. Don't need yeah, braces so, anymore because you don't have teeth. So then, so then, what we have is a prolonged um, um, moment of two minutes of Tootie dialing the phone and um, performing a collect call to Harrison Rifle Ramsey with the full number that takes. <laughs> two minutes for her to like get out and then it takes an additional like two minutes for him to walk towards her. Yes. He steps closely and well, it looks like ringing. he's going to kill her. Yeah. And then he puts down his bags and she's like, I'm about to fucking narc on you motherfucker. And then he's like, okay, well give me the receiver. I'll do it. I'll take my licks or whatever. Takes the receiver from her and then they hug and that's it. And you know, he did not tell that. No. He was like, Dad, hey, I just wanted to say that they have these cool keychains. I uh, have one that says rifle with, you know, everybody's names on it. You want a rifle keychain? Yeah. I got to go. Skiing. Love you. Bye. Yeah. I'm off. Uh, FYI, um, I'm off to Lake Placid. They just got some fresh new snow. Okay, bye. Classic. Classic Marshall. Yeah. Um, and that's that's our episode. We just keep ending with these dramatic endings. Yeah. 
Very dramatic. And you know it's going to be dramatic next week because you know what's happening, right? Oh, no. Is it a two-parter? It's a two-parter! Is this the one where Joe goes to a convent? Kind of, yeah. Okay. I don't think we ever go to a convent. I think it's just, she's a nun in the cafeteria. Oh, okay. So she's, is it because, is she sent to the convent because she's getting too much cock joy? I believe that this is uh, Blair's sister comes to town. Mm. And everybody's like, oh my God, you're so much fun. And she's like, thanks, I know. And I'm beautiful <laughs> too. And everybody's like, you are. And then she's like, by the way, I'm becoming a nun. And everybody's <laughs> like, what? Like, she's like, like, says like, throwing I'm, it away. I'm a leper and you might want to throw out your food. And <laughs> then uh, Joe is like, oh, I'm going to become a nun too. This whole not having sex with dudes thing sounds really good. But then she does something that I won't spoil for you that okay. um, makes her think, oh, maybe I'm not a nun. And that maybe will take I'm two not episodes. A nun. Okay, sweet. Yes. Excited. Do you have a game plan on how you're going to tackle this two-parter? Um, I will probably hem and haw for a oh, while. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, probably I'll probably do it in two quick, two bursts. Two bursts. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to try to do it in one if I can. Okay. Uh, it might be hard, but I usually feel like the second half goes a lot faster for me. Mm -hmm. In the first half, I guess the first half for me is like, oh, I've got to look at this actor, that actor, the yeah, other yeah, thing. Yeah. Um, and then usually most of the actors are introduced by the second half, except in the case of, of course, Edna Dix. Of course, Edna Dix. Mm -hmm. One of those last scene introductions. Uh, never forget Edna Dix. Anyway, all right. Well, I'm excited. We are on to, if you are following along on your DVDs, we have just gotten past the second disc of the three disc set for season four, which means we got one more disc left of Eastland and we are gone, baby. And two of those are two parters. Ah. So <laughs> there will only be six more facts of faxes of this season. Wow. Only six. Only six. We've been crushing it. <laughs> I got a microphone now. Yeah. Great. You look, like right. you, you look like you work in telemarketing. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. This was, there was one that didn't have a headset. It was like $60 more than this. Yeah. Like, well, no. <laughs> These were my options. Anyway, all right. Well, Lovelies, it's been, you know, the Lovelies have been telling me that this is going to be a fun two-parter. Oh, um, good. And I don't recall it that way. I recall the next two-parter being a lot more fun. But this one, the next two two-parters. But this one, um, people are excited to see your response to it. Great. Well, that's the thing. You know what? Trust the lovelies, Dominic. Trust. The I lovelies. always do. They've yeah. never steered me wrong. No, never. All right. Well, until next time, stay lovely, guys. Yeah, and don't drink and drive. And fuck Steve. Fuck Steve and fuck Marshall. Fuck Marshall, too. And you know what? Fuck Paul Walsh. Ugh. Paul Walsh. Thumbs down. Bye. Bye.